Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 245, Confirmation. Back home at 15 Minsk Street, Klein was in no hurry to head above the gray fog to perform a divination. Instead, he acted as though nothing had happened. In the process, he heard an illusory prayer and vaguely recognized it as a woman's voice. After experiencing the ravaging murmurs of the true creator, my ability in this aspect has apparently improved a little. Klein turned the newspaper while engrossed in thought and settled himself on the reclining chair in a motionless half-slumped state. He waited until the clock nearly struck ten, before putting down what he was doing and went to the bathroom on the second floor to clean himself up. Entering the bedroom and pulling the curtains shut, Klein went above the gray fog. He saw that the crimson star symbolizing justice was constantly expanding and contracting, and it was also echoing with prayers. Klein spread out his spirituality and made contact. Dressed in a white silk nightgown, Miss Justice appeared in front of him. Her figure was still blurry, as if she was in bed. After reciting his honorable name, Audrey cut to the chase. Ambassador Backerland is a Sequence 6 conspiracist of the Hunter Pathway. He's suspected to have a Sequence 5 assistant. After I obtained detailed information, I got someone to inquire Mr. He has agreed to accept the assassination mission. But the conditions are 10,000 gold pounds or any of the potion formulas of Unshadowed, Cataclysmic Intera, Prophet, and Manipulator. They do not need to be complete. A portion of the formula would suffice. I chose the former and paid an advance of 2,000 pounds. Honorable Mr. Fool, was my decision correct? 10,000 gold pounds. The corner of Klein's lips twitched as he forced himself to focus on the matter. The sequence 5 assistant should be that seer pathway infiltrator. The first thing that should be done is to overestimate the enemy. Would Mr. A have the ability to do it? Would he neglect the job after taking the money? Cataclysmic intra, profit, manipulator, and unshadowed are likely sequence 4 seconds. That is the threshold of a high sequence beyonder. It is very likely that Mr. A is one of the 22 oracles of the Aurora Order. To be stationed in the City of Cities, Backland, means that he's second only to the five saints of the Aurora Order's upper echelons. He must be the cream of the crop among the oracles. The Aurora Order wields the secret suppliant pathway which is the direct route to the true creator. As an oracle, he has a high probability of being a beyonder of this sequence chain. Based on Backland's position, it can be inferred that he's at Sequencer's 5, Shepherd. Of course, he could also be a Rose Bishop that's one sequence lower, but that would mean that he's more outstanding in other aspects, such as his intelligence. I have to remind Miss Justice that she shouldn't have too many interactions with Mr. of the Beyonders of the Secret Suppliant sequence are either already lunatics exhibiting abnormalities or lunatics who have hidden their insanity well, almost without exception. Sequence 8 listeners in this sequence pathway often hear the voice of the true creator. Yes, only a lunatic would be bold enough to accept the mission of assassinating an Intis ambassador and have the courage to complete it. I have here a portion of the unshadowed potion formula, as well as the corresponding ritual needed for the advancement. This can save Miss Justice 10,000 gold pounds. Why would Mr. A only need the formulas of unshadowed, cataclysmic intra, profit, and manipulator? Are these paths that can be swapped at high sequences of the secret suppliant pathway? That's a bit too much. That makes it five in total. Unshadowed is from the eternal blazing sun. Cataclysmic intera sounds like it's from the Lord of Storms or maybe the Evernight Goddess. I previously determined that the eternal blazing sun, Lord of Storms, and the God of Knowledge and Wisdom have pathways that are relatively similar, therefore, they view each other with animosity. From the looks of it, Cataclysmic Intra belongs to the Lord of Storms and is Sequence 4 of the Sailor Sequence. Prophet is likely from the God of Knowledge and Wisdom. Then which pathway does Manipulator belong to? It'll be interesting if they can all be exchanged with the sequence corresponding to the true creator. Yes, I cannot give the unshadowed formula to Mr. and not even a portion. The Aurora Order members are all lunatics who are always looking for opportunities to take revenge on the world to the detriment of public safety. Items of strategic importance must not be traded with them. This isn't just a question of the bottom line. It also involves my own safety. Once the time is ripe, those lunatics from the Aurora Order might very well sacrifice the entire city. Let Miss Justice spend the 10,000 pounds then. Part of it includes the payment she would like to give to my adorer. The rest can be made up to her with the knowledge I already know. Klein reached out and pinched his cheek. He didn't reply to Justice immediately. Instead, he conjured a pen and paper ready to make a divination. Klein had no idea who Merrick's friend was. He could only tell from the pronoun she that the person was a woman. Failure was inevitable if he wanted to directly divine the reliability of the person in question. 
However, Klein could make an indirect divination regarding his own safety, which would have a much higher success rate. As for whether he would suffer an interference or how accurate the outcome would be, he wasn't worried at all thanks to the gray fog shielding. After more than 10 seconds of deliberation, Klein wrote, It's risky for me to hire Merrick's friend to be my bodyguard for three days. Putting the pen away, he removed his spirit pendulum, focused his mind, and quickly performed the divination. When he opened his eyes, he saw that the topaz pendant was rotating clockwise. However, the amplitude was very small and its speed was very slow. There's a certain risk, but it's quite low. Reliable. Klein nodded slightly and changed to divine about Mr. A. Similarly, he had no direct contact with Mr. A, and all he knew was based on descriptions and inference. It was difficult to find out whether or not he was capable enough or willing to keep his promise. All he could do was make an indirect divination. As an excellent seer, Klein quickly determined the direction, and that was to divine Ambassador Backerland. This ambassador had relatively more connections with him, and the information he had about him was even more detailed. Klein knew very well what the other party was involved in, and as a divination target, there were no problems. After some thought, Klein wrote, Backerlin Jean Madden will have his life threatened by Mr. A. To prevent it from failing, he tried his best to make the words vague in this low-confidence divination and didn't require a definite answer. This time, Klein saw that the spirit pendulum was still rotating clockwise, but it had become faster and the amplitude had increased. It means that Mr. A will attempt to complete the mission, and that there's a good chance of success. Klein slowly exhaled and began to respond to Miss Justice's prayer. Sure, there's no problems with your decision. You absolutely must not show yourself when entrusting this mission. I adore wishes for 1,000 pounds for his activities. It will be done in the same way as before, and it would be best if it can be completed by tomorrow. This will be payment for the light supply and formula. You do not need to seek out news regarding the secret order any further. However, if you obtain any relevant information, I will do a trade with you. After learning that the infiltrator was a Bayonder in the Seer pathway, Klein's need for information about the secret order became less urgent. He had originally wanted to ask for more than 1,000 pounds, but in consideration of how Miss Justice had to pay 10,000 pounds to assassinate the ambassador, it was likely that her finances would be stretched to the limit. Therefore, he only asked for the minimum. After doing all of this, Klein didn't linger and immediately returned to the real world. Audrey was holding a music score and humming a melody. The red moon was faintly discernible outside the window. Suddenly, a thick gray fog appeared in front of her. A figure seated on an ancient chair looked down at her and spoke in a low voice. Audrey let out a breath of relief after hearing Mr. Fool's response. She was no longer as nervous as she was. One thousand pounds. My debt to Mr. Fool is close to being paid off. I feel so much more relaxed suddenly. Audrey rested the music score against her chest and thought with her dimples showing. Although she only had £1,000 to spend for quite a considerable period of time in the coming days, being put in a tight financial situation, all she needed to do was grit her teeth, and squeezing out a £1,000 wouldn't be a problem. I'll borrow more from Glaint and drag it out with more installments. Audrey had quite a good education in finances, after all. Her father was a powerful banker behind the scenes. At noon on Thursday, Klein heard another illusory prayer. He then confirmed that Miss Justice had deposited the money into his anonymous account. The bank reconciliation and liquidation done in Backland could be completed on the same day, meaning that from Friday, Klein would be able to withdraw the cash from any Backland bank branch in the city. After lunch, Klein once again saw Mary Gale. She led him outside the Quellog Club, where the two members were waiting. One was a well-known surgeon, Aaron Ceres, and the other was the aristocratic equestrian teacher, Talon Dumont. After greeting each other, the lanky and somewhat aloof doctor wearing gold-rimmed glasses entered the club first, leaving the equestrian teacher, Talon, who had short brown curly hair to converse with Klein amidst smiles. If it wasn't for Mary mentioning you, I wouldn't have known that Backland has had an additional outstanding detective join its ranks. If there's anything I need to do in the future, I'll look for you. Then, let me thank you in advance. Klein smiled in response. According to Mary's introduction on the carriage, he learned that Talon was originally of noble blood. His grandfather had a noble title of Viscount, but it was a pity that his grandfather had squandered all his wealth. His father had nearly ten brothers and more than six sisters, and his nobles whose titles were determined by the amount of land they possessed. Once the amount of land went beneath a particular standard, the hereditary nobility title would be reduced. However, that also depended on the king's mood. Talon was unlike the other children of nobility who could obtain a considerable sum of money when they reached adulthood. 
and due to his grandfather's reputation, he had no means of entering the government as an employee or to be a butler of another noble family. Therefore, he could only play to his advantages and became an equestrian teacher for many nobles. His income was quite sizable, with about 400 pounds a year. Sigh, divorce really leads to poverty. It was unknown if Talon was hinting at Mary Gale's situation or if he was reminded of his grandfather who seemed to be more of Antis' ancestry. Unable to engage in the conversation, Klein followed him into the Quellog Club, where he saw a large, brightly lit hall. Chapter 246 Strange Omen Aaron and Talon left the Quellog Club after they separately completed the nomination form. It wasn't a weekend, the former had two more operations in the afternoon, and the latter had to teach Viscount Conrad's youngest son horse riding. The teenager needed to ensure that he didn't embarrass himself during the Backlund social events in the second half of the year. Klein watched the manservant dressed in a red vest and a maid in a beautiful dress come and go a few times before finally delivering him his own proof of membership and a badge with the symbol of the Frost Constellation engraved on it. An entry fee of 50 pounds. There are still three and a half months left this year, with an annual fee of four pounds a year. The manservant in the red vest pushed the two objects to Klein. Klein took out the 57 pounds which Mary Gale had given him and handed him 54 pounds. The amount beyond the entry fee and annual fee was Mary's first payment. She was very pleased with how quickly Klein obtained information on Doragu Gale's mistress, as well as her photo. 50 pounds membership. Madam Mary is such a generous lady. While Klein watched the manservant and the maid verify the money and confirm the exact amount, he recalled Stellan Sammer's private introduction. Mary's father was a co-founder of the Coim Company and had a 20% stake. It was originally just a small company that barely made money, but as Backland's pollution worsened and the demand for anthracite and charcoal increased, the company rapidly expanded to become one of the top 10 companies in the capital's industry. As such, Mary's net worth skyrocketed. The only problem was that when she was married to Doragu Gale, the company was still quite an unknown company. Her father hadn't paid much attention to using the shares as her dowry and didn't proceed with any protection of estate gifting and had instead used the more popular willing of gifts. The former referred to the dowry as an independent and separate estate of the woman and not subjected to her husband's control. Even the right of use depended on the woman, while the latter assigned the dowry's ownership to the entire family. However, the husband had to immediately make a valid will to promise that if he passed away before his partner, the split of the estate would be two to four times the rights and interests of the dowry received, after which, the rest would proceed according to the normal inheritance laws which could effectively guarantee the livelihood of the widow. If Mary initiated a divorce before she could get evidence of Doragu's adultery, the coin company shares would be divided equally between both parties. Klein remembered Stellan saying enviously, the current value of those shares is currently close to 20,000 gold pounds. Adding the other property in their name, Mary is a truly wealthy lady. Once she's divorced, she will definitely become the target of many men in Backlund, including some nobles. That's only enough money for Miss Justice to assassinate Ambassador Backerland twice. Klein suddenly thought about that when he saw the red-vested manservant, and the good-looking maid bow at him. Mr. Moriarty, welcome to the Quellog Club. Upon hearing this, Klein picked up the proof of membership and the frost badge. The former was made of elastic paper which looked like a card with Klein's name and his membership start date on it. After applying an imprint of his index finger, the proof of membership was officially ready for use. The latter was the Quellog Club's distinctive badge, named for its founding in early November, which corresponded to the month of the frost constellation. The symbol and the number 192 were printed on the front, followed by Sherlock Moriarty imprinted on the back. The club now has 192 members. Klein asked casually, Yes, our club doesn't accept people without a recommendation. The red-vested manservant beamed and introduced, On the first floor, there's a buffet cafeteria, bar, library, squash room, conference room, and card room. You can use them all for free. The food and wine are free for your sampling as well. There are 16 lounge rooms and two small conference rooms on the second floor. They are also free and can be used as long as they aren't occupied. The good-looking maid pointed to the rear and said, There are two tennis courts on the lawn, totally free of charge. There are two shooting ranges underground, and you only need to pay the corresponding rental fee of the equipment. If you aren't satisfied with the simple buffet, you can order a la carte. We have an exclusive chef, and you just need to pay for the ingredients. Board, lodging, and entertainment are all provided for, as expected of a high-end club. Klein sincerely thanked Mrs. Mary. He smiled warmly and said, Send someone to show me around so that I can familiarize myself with the environment. 
Afterward, give me allowance to take an afternoon nap. All right. The red manservant made an inviting gesture. After familiarizing himself with the Quellog Club's environment, Klein entered a lounge and carefully studied the layout of the place. He discovered it was similar to a hotel room of the later generation. It was said to be decorated in the Intis style. I have to consider how to obtain evidence of Doragu's affair tomorrow. It's simply impossible to hide the flash of the camera. In other words, I only have one shot at taking a picture. And if I do that, I'll definitely be kicked out of the club. I have to think of a safe way. I'll read through the papers later and try to determine the progress regarding Ian's case through the news. From there, I can determine which three days I should be guarded. Klein paced back and forth, lost in thought. At that moment, his heart suddenly palpitated as he tensed up. Is this the premonition of a clown? However, there are no scenes in my mind. Klein felt the air around him turn still like it was the calm before the storm. Soon, this feeling disappeared, as if nothing had happened. Could it be that danger is approaching? But nothing like this happened when I was attacked by Mu Assault. Puzzled, Klein pulled out a coin and divined if he would be attacked in the next few days. The answer was negative. After thinking for a few seconds, Klein drew the curtains and pretended to take an afternoon nap. He took four steps counterclockwise and went above the gray fog. He sat down and pondered for a long time before muttering to himself, I will be in grave danger in the next few days. After repeating the statement, he flicked the coin again and saw the copper-colored object tumble down and land in his open palm. This time, the portrait of the king was facing up. It meant a positive result. My reaction just now really was an omen that danger is coming. Klein narrowed his eyes and leaned back in his chair. He was rather puzzled by this matter. Whether it was as a seer or clown, they had never displayed such abilities before. Even if they could predict danger, it was because the target was right in front of him or beside him. There was nobody around me. From the fact that my divination was misled, it must have involved a relatively higher sequencer, most likely Backerlin's assistant. In the end, it actually gave me a premonition. This isn't scientific, oh, uh, this isn't mystic. There must be something else behind it, but I can't be certain why yet. Klein looked around and saw the boundless fog, crimson and still, the palace standing as it had always stood. He reined in his doubts and temporarily stopped thinking about the reason. Instead, he focused his attention on the attack that was about to occur. After several more divinations, Klein found that he could only confirm that there would be great danger in the next few days. It couldn't be shortened to three days, two days, or even five hours. In other words, he could only obtain a somewhat vague revelation. And in a dream divination, he saw Ian dressed in his old coat, standing in the street with the elegant gas lamps and the blurry crimson moon behind him. Other than this image, there was nothing else. How should I interpret this? Klein thought for a moment. He could only assume that this was the prelude to danger. Without further delay, he returned to the real world, left the Quellog Club, and went to the nearby Hilston branch of the Backland Bank to withdraw the remaining hundred pounds from his account. The sum of one thousand pounds from justice hasn't been cleared yet and reconciled. Without the corresponding information sent to the branches, the account wasn't synchronized, and, theoretically speaking, there was a loophole. Klein could withdraw 100 pounds from another branch and seize the opportunity when all the accounts were out of sync. However, this was only in theory. In order to avoid similar acts, the banks had many rules on anonymous accounts. First, it was to enhance the transmission of similar information in the same city. Second, it was to limit a single withdrawal to no more than 500 pounds. And third, if the last withdrawal wasn't done locally, a telegram was needed to inquire about it. And today, Klein encountered the third situation. Putting away the money, he took a horse carriage to the Backland Bridge area and entered the Bravehearts Bar. Under Kaspars's guidance, he saw Merrick sitting in the card room. He wasn't surrounded by zombies. Klein discarded the idea of using his spirituality to wrap Azik's copper whistle, slapped a 100 pounds on the table, and said to the pale Merrick, I agree to the deal. I'll pay in advance of 100 pounds. I'll pay another 300 pounds every additional day I'm protected. The protection begins now. Merrick's gaze fell past him and landed somewhere behind him. He nodded and said, All right, she has agreed. Ah, uh, Klein turned back in surprise only to see the wall, and nothing but air. He secretly activated his spirit vision. He but failed to discover anything. Merrick stuffed the 100 pounds into his pocket and said indifferently, You can return now. She has begun protecting you in a hidden way. If I hadn't divined this beforehand, I would definitely think of all of you as cheats. Klein surveyed his surroundings and deliberately acted as though he left with clenched teeth. Along the way, he would occasionally activate and deactivate his spirit vision, constantly observing the outside through the carriage windows, but he didn't find his so-called bodyguard. 
Back at 15 Minsk Street, Klein closed the door, went into the bathroom, turned on the tap, and washed his hands. The sound of water splashing disappeared as he shook off the water droplets and wiped his palms with a towel. Then, he raised his head to look at himself in the mirror to inspect his appearance. At this moment, he saw himself phasing away in the mirror before transforming into a woman wearing a black regal dress. The woman had light golden hair and blue eyes. She looked very delicate but her face was abnormally pale. She wore a small black bonnet, lifted her skirt, and bowed at Klein. This, without hiding his surprise, Klein took a few steps back and leaned against the wall. Only then did he realize that this might be the bodyguard he had hired for 1,000 pounds. The image in the mirror quickly dimmed and Klein saw himself again. Everything had been restored back to normal. Chapter 247 The Whole Story The figure in the mirror was clear, but it was as though the woman in the black regal dress had never appeared. Klein secretly activated his spirit vision, but didn't find anything. Did I just hire a female ghost as my bodyguard? She's even stranger than a female ghost. At the very least, one can see ghosts with spirit vision. Klein thoughtfully touched Azik's copper whistle in his pocket, feeling nothing but its cold chill. Like before, it didn't have any additional changes. She's unaffected by the copper whistle. Seems like she isn't an undead creature. However, I can't be sure. Back then, the copper whistle was buried with me, but the corpses surrounding me didn't act abnormally. Was it because those buried in the cemetery have experienced a send-off by the priests, and bishops. When does it work and when doesn't it? When this business with the ambassador is over and if I'm still alive, I'll go to the cemetery and try to figure out the scope of its effect and its limits. I can't always carry a time bomb like this. Klein washed his face and walked out of the bathroom, just as he picked up the newspaper in the living room and was going to read it in the living room or bedroom. He heard the doorbell ring. Klein's mind tensed up when he heard the tinkling sounds. He put on his coat, with all kinds of materials in it, and walked towards the door gingerly. He clearly knew that danger was approaching in the next few days. After standing behind the door and waiting for a moment, the scene outside naturally surfaced in Klein's mind. The crimson moon was faintly discernible in the sky. The elegant gas lamps on both sides of the street lit up the wet road. A boy wearing an old coat stood there. His bright red eyes were deep and adrift. Ian Wright, why did he appear? Isn't this what I saw in my dream divination? Is this the prelude to danger? Klein opened the door and took two cautious steps back. Detective Moriarty, Ian took off his brown top hat, bowed, and said in a low voice, I came to apologize. I'm sorry to have involved you in such a dangerous matter. Klein creased his eyebrows and probed. What you should have done is head to the police station. Ian looked around and bowed his head. I just came out from MI9. Uh, is that the name of the military's special department? Klein stepped aside, pointed at the living room and said, Maybe we can have a chat. I have to at least know what placed me in this situation. He sighed inwardly. Ian didn't stand on ceremony as he followed Klein into the living room and sat in the same spot as he did the last time. He was just about to open his mouth when Klein suddenly added, If what you plan on saying will put me in greater danger, then there's no need to tell me about it. No, everything will soon be over. Ian had a calmness that was beyond his age. Klein was relieved and asked out of curiosity, so what exactly happened? Before he could finish his sentence, he saw a figure emerge from the panes of the oriel window across the room. A black regal dress, long hair tied in a bun, blue eyes, delicate features, and a pale face. It was the woman who had previously greeted Klein in the mirror. This woman seemed to find an illusory high back chair and sat down. Her left palm supported her right elbow while her right hand supported her face, pretending to listen attentively while appearing expressionless. For a moment, Klein was left at a loss. Ian, who had been silent for a few seconds, said softly, In fact, Detective Zereal is a spy for the Faceac Empire. He adopted several vagrant children and taught them how to gather intelligence. I am one of them. So that's how it is. I was involved in a huge spy conspiracy. Klein suddenly felt enlightened. Ian looked at the coffee table and continued, We have the advantage of age, and are often ignored by others, allowing us to gather a lot of useful information. Two weeks ago, I stumbled upon clues regarding Helmasuin's manuscript. Helmasuin. Klein found the name familiar. Ian looked up at him and explained, Tyranny von Helmasuin, the greatest scientist after Emperor Roselle, a mathematician, a mechanist, and the father of the second-generation difference machine. So it's him. Klein suddenly remembered the relevant information. He wasn't only a great scientist, but also a crazy scientist. 
he believed that the inherent flaw in the existence of humans could only be fixed through machines. He loved eating sugar as if it was his own energy source. He mysteriously disappeared while researching a third-generation difference machine, and was an important figure that every country was trying to find. His manuscript does the manuscript involve third-generation difference machines? Klein asked probingly. A difference machine was a mechanical device for computing. It could effectively improve the efficiency of scientific research and various projects. In Klein's opinion, it was an alternative computer in the age of steam. Of course, it could only do computation at present. Ian shook his head. I'm not sure. I didn't actually see it. Perhaps it had some related ideas. He paused for a moment, then went on to recount what had happened. When I reported this to Detective Z Real, he was very happy and told me to follow up on that lead while he immediately reported it to his superior. It took me some time to determine where the manuscript was, but I was afraid of the danger, so I didn't steal it directly. I decided to return to Detective Z Real, and after that, it was as I told you. Detective Z Real's house was infiltrated while many of the tiny traps were not restored, and he didn't respond to my contact requests. The Z Manger gang tried to capture me. With your help, I confirmed the death of Detective Z Real. I took a fake tooth from his corpse. Oh, that happened after we parted. Detective Z Real told me that, inscribed on the inside of the fake tooth, there was a method to urgently contact his superior. It was a method that even he didn't know of and was something he would only remove if an accident occurred. Klein nodded slightly and said, So you sent a telegram. A rare look of surprise flashed across Ian's face as he asked, Did the people from MI9 tell you that? No, a friend of mine happened to see you on Bacardi Street. Klein casually made up an excuse. I see. Ian nodded in depression. I got in touch with Detective Z Real's superior in Backland via telegram and arranged the time, place, and manner of meeting. But soon enough, I was found by the Z Manger gang. No, to be exact, it was an intelligence officer of the Intis Republic. That was what the people from MI9 people told me. Fortunately, MI9 arrived in time, and both sides engaged in a chaotic battle. I took this opportunity to escape. However, when I met with Detective Z Real's superior this afternoon, I was once again ambushed by the Intis intelligence officers. Unfortunately, I was caught by them, and I was very afraid of dying, so I told them everything that I knew. However, they didn't keep their promise and still wanted to kill me. At that moment, MI9 finally found me. It is only during such times when you look like a 15 or 16 year old teenager. Just as Klein was reflecting over this, he suddenly thought of a problem from what Ian had just said. Back when he discovered that something important was left behind on Zeriel's corpse and that Ian had successfully taken it away, he had written the matter off, thinking that the Bayonder was lacking in skill and that the Bayonder had missed out on something because the mediumship provided little useful information. However, after confirming that the ambassador had a mid-sequence Bayonder of the Seer pathway, the situation became extremely peculiar. With powerful mediumship, it was impossible for the fake tooth to not be discovered. Leaving the body in such a remote and hard-to-find place didn't seem like a trap. Combined with Ian's description, the answer was obvious. Klein nodded and said, Have you ever thought of the possibility that Zeriel's superior has traitors around him? A traitor who has defected to the Intis intelligence services. That's also why Zeriel was exposed and killed when he obtained the clue to the manuscript, as well as why you were ambushed. It was because the Intis ambassador had information about Zeriel's superior, which was why he didn't pay much attention to the urgent communication method inscribed on the inside of the tooth. Zeriel's report to his superior directly led to his demise. Ian fell into a daze when he heard that. It took him quite a while before he clenched his fists in anger, trying hard to compose himself as he said, I didn't think of that. You really are an excellent detective. He quietly let out a breath of air and changed the topic. I have divulged the whereabouts of the manuscript to MI9 and everything else. They also mentioned your predicament in passing. Ha! Huh. They didn't suspect me of lying, nor did they send anyone to watch me. All of them went to vie for the manuscript. However, with that kind of pressure, no one can lie. Having said that, Ian stood up and gave a deep bow. Please allow me to apologize again. Sorry to have involved you in this. Actually, you don't need to hide anything from me. Having understood the entire situation, Klein smiled and said, No, the main problem in this matter was because I made a mistake that made me end up in my current situation. As he was listening, he used Ian's description of the entire situation and his reflections of the past few days and confirmed that he had made two mistakes. When I discovered that Ian's matter ran deeper than it appeared, I still accepted the request. 
that wasn't a problem since I only felt that it involved gangs, and there would be, at most, one or two Bayonders who wouldn't dare expose themselves. But the divination lacked enough information and ended with a failure. This was within the limits of what I could have resolved by myself, and typically speaking, there wouldn't have been any trouble. I could even take the opportunity to come into contact with Backlund's Bayonders. After finding Zeriel's corpse and confirming that the matter ran deep, I should have considered the sensitivity of my identity and decisively extricated myself from this case. I should have let Ian deal with the subsequent matters himself. This wouldn't be problematic and would be a rather careful choice. One of the mistakes I made was that I didn't flinch or reveal anything about Ian when New Assault came to me. I only thought that he was from a gang, and that there were some Bayonders behind that gang. Who would have guessed that it would involve a figure like the Antis Ambassador? Even more so, I never expected New Assault to be so rash. After failing his mission, he didn't threaten, intimidate me or proceed with other options. Instead, he came straight to kill me so that mediumship could be performed. He didn't even give me the chance to regret my decision. As a result, my situation worsened. So, this isn't too subjective or too serious a mistake. The one mistake that really caused me to be in such a passive situation was a tiny mistake I made from the very beginning. I had rented the house and accepted the mission as Sherlock Moriarty without donning a disguise. This resulted in me not being able to flee after my identity as a Bayonder was exposed to the ambassador. Even as I acted horrified and frantic, making MI9 and the police department believe that my taking flight would only be normal, I didn't dare flee. I was afraid that when the ambassador failed to find a target for revenge, he would inform the officials about me. And according to my experience as a Nighthawk, most official enforcers like the Nighthawks, Machinery Hivemind, and mandated punishers harbor animosity towards uncontrolled Bayonders. They definitely wouldn't ignore me just because I'm a low-sequence Bayonder and would begin an investigation. In time, my looks will be clear evidence. I will then be pursued by high-sequence Bayonders from the Church of the Goddess because I resurrected despite having been involved with a Grade Zero sealed artifact. There's no chance for such matters to be suddenly forgotten or thought of as nothing by others. I had to plan for the worst-case scenario in advance, and if I only reacted when the ambassador took action, it would definitely be too late. Whether it's an assassination, finding a bodyguard, or buying items, all of them will require time. Only if the ambassador and his assistant dies or attention is diverted to the investigation of his death will I be able to resolve this latent danger. His assistant doesn't have an official status, so he can't interact with the officials. For a mere sequence 9 or sequence 8 at best, someone whose whereabouts are unknown, there's no reason to go through the effort to report me. Of course, his death is the best outcome, then there won't be any latent danger. Compared to finding Mr. Azik for help or having attention placed on me because of Zero Minus 8 again, as well as being pursued by high-sequence Bayonders, assassinating the ambassador is the relatively simpler choice. Even if it fails, I can only bear one of the two outcomes. Sigh. Everything originated from a small oversight at the beginning. I just imagined that in a metropolis with over 5 million people and few people knowing me while I deliberately avoided the Nighthawks, there was no need for me to don a disguise every day, since it would be easier for others to notice something amiss. Yet, for such a small mistake, I would have to pay over 10,000 gold pounds as the price without having any guarantee of resolving it. I'm really like a clown, with one mistake triggering a chain reaction, only to result in a desperate attempt to balance myself so as to please the audience. This is all because of my lack of experience. This is the first time in my two lifetimes combined that I've ever been a fugitive. Once this matter is completely resolved, exposing my identity as a Bayonder would no longer be that dangerous. They would only think that I obtained a potion while finding a bodyguard and not doubt my origins. Of course, I'll have to get used to wearing glasses and a mustache in the future so that the people around me will gradually get used to my new image. In the future when they ask me about me, they will only think of this new image. Having thought through the entire matter, Klein's laugh became more pronounced, making Ian feel strange. It's time for me to leave. I'll need to disappear for a while, otherwise I might be thrown into jail. Ian put on his hat, bade farewell, and left. Klein didn't stop him, watching him disappear into the crimson moonlight, while the woman by the oriel window had disappeared without him realizing it. Chapter 248, Waiting from Both Sides With both sides being aware of the whereabouts of Helmasuan's manuscript, this matter would come to an end tonight. Therefore, the ambassador would have the freedom to take revenge. Is this the reason for the impending danger? Klein gained a rough understanding of the divination results and the inexplicable omen. 
if he didn't have the language of foulness charm or the powerful bodyguard that cost him 1,000 pounds for three days, he would have shamelessly gone to the police station or the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery's headquarters in Backlund, St. Hireland Cathedral for a temporary stay. He could avoid any possible attacks and await the assassination of the ambassador. As for how successful the assassination would be, Klein wasn't confident either. He had already considered the worst outcome and had a plan for it. But now, with the double the preparations, he no longer wanted to avoid it. He would stay at home and pretend that he knew nothing. Deep down, he was even looking forward to having his attackers come knocking at his door. Sequence 9 Hunter Mew Assault was killed by me. If they send someone else again, they would at least be a sequence 7, or even a sequence 6 or 5. They might even come in numbers, but regardless, as long as I finish them, I'll obtain formulas and Bayonder characteristics. I can then make up for some of my losses. Yes, I'll tell Miss Bodyguard that I had good luck and managed to benefit from the black ear that I bought and became a Bayonder. After all, when the battle becomes intense, there's no way to hide it at that point. Besides, what I'm saying is nearly the truth. I did benefit quite significantly from the black ear. As Klein considered what would soon follow, he almost instinctively drew the sign of the crimson moon on his chest. May the goddess bless me that the Bayonder who comes is the one from the seer pathway. He prayed silently. As he thought of this, he looked around the room for his bodyguard. He was worried that she would run away without a sound after hearing the whole story. The lights in the dining room were warm, illuminating the coffee table, sofa, and chairs. There was no one else in the room except him. As Klein gradually grew nervous, he suddenly saw a face appear on the glass cover of the gas lamp in the living room. The face was pale, with pale gold hair and delicate looks. This lady is quite confident in her own strength. Klein's mind calmed down, and he whispered to himself, I'm also a Bayonder. I made a gamble on an item I bought from Kaspar's gathering and benefited from it. But it was only beneficial for me. What he said was true. No matter what method he had to face, these sentences would endure a truth test. But when these two sentences were put together, one would think that the benefits made him a Bayonder. The face on the glass cover nodded slightly and quickly disappeared without any other reaction. Klein's expression didn't seem to change, but he secretly exhaled in his heart. Without taking off his coat, he went back to the sofa and picked up a newspaper and started reading. After a while, the tinkling sound echoed again. Someone had rung his doorbell again. Who is it? Klein immediately tensed up. He stuffed his hands into his pockets, touching his tarot cards and language of foulness charm. He slowly walked towards the door, and with the help of his abilities as a clown, he predicted what he would see after opening the door. The crimson moon was still faintly visible, the elegant gas lamps were unchanged, and a sergeant in a black and white checkered uniform with three chevrons on his epaulets was impatiently waiting by the door. He had a short, brown beard and he was none other than the sergeant who had dealt with Sherlock Moriarty's case of self-defense. I think Jurgen mentioned his name. Sergeant Faxine. Well, I can receive the ten-pound bail tomorrow or the next day. What is he doing here? Did MI9 send him to find Ian Wright? Or to inform me that I should temporarily hide away from danger? Confused, Klein grabbed the handle. Inside the Intis Embassy of Backlands Westboro, the lights were on. The scent of various perfumes and alcohol, accompanied by melodious melodies stretched out to every corner. A ball was being held. During his years as an ambassador, Backerland had often held balls at the embassy, inviting the kingdom's bankers, big factory owners, philanthropists, and other well-known, rich and powerful people, as well as lawyers. Random opportunities were also given to some of the lower-ranked merchants. In this atmosphere, he would tell the guests about the prosperity and openness of Trier and how the Intis Republic was no longer dominated by the likes of the nobles, bankers, factory owners, and lawyers. They, directly and indirectly, took over a large portion of the parliamentary seats, determining the direction of the government policies, enjoying true freedom and high statuses. Today, Backerland was doing the same thing. With a wine glass in hand, he flitted around the guests, as if to prove that he was present at the ball without leaving. They should have gotten the manuscript by now. After learning that Ian Wright appeared at the telegraph office from that trembling detective, I've been putting plans into action. Now is the time to reap the rewards. Backerland, with his thin but classy face, took a sip of the blood like Amir wine and headed for the balcony, intending to take a breath of the cool night air. After learning that Ian had sent the telegram, as a veteran conspiracist and professional intelligence officer, Backerland was acutely aware that Ian was contacting his superior's superior. Therefore, he quickly made the double spy that had infiltrated the FASAC Empire's Backland intelligence team investigate and obtain the meeting time, location, 
and manner agreed upon by Ian and the team leader. After that, he pretended that nothing had happened and continued to send people to look for Ian near Bacardi Street. He successfully found Ian and also attracted the attention of MI9. According to his plan, his intelligence officer had deliberately let Ian go so that MI9 would think that they were on the same starting line. After paralyzing his main opponent, he called in other unexposed intelligence agents to ambush Ian and the FASAC Empire's team leader. He wanted to find the manuscript and smuggle it out of the Lone Kingdom without being detected by the MI9. The situation had progressed as smoothly as he had expected, but the news that came back in the evening left his heart heavy. People from MI9 had actually appeared. They had appeared despite being supposedly fooled. With Rasego around, it's definitely not because of divination. Besides, MI9 isn't good at divination at all. That means we have a spy among our ranks. Let's hope that Rasego can be one step ahead of them and grab the manuscript to hand over to Shadow for extraction. Backerland had deliberately organized the ball in order to avoid suspicion, but as such, he was unable to involve himself with the developments. All he could do was pray that his subordinates would amount to something. According to his plans, once Rasego succeeded, he would immediately transfer the items to another intelligence officer, one that had never been activated before. Then Rasego would lure MI9 away and, by creating some trouble, keep them out of sight and distract them from his partner. During this process, Backerland requested Rasego to kill the detective while he was at it. If it wasn't for him, no one from MI9 would have known about it. Everything would have gone smoothly. My involvement with the Z-Manger gang wouldn't have been revealed, and I wouldn't be transferred back to the country. He actually didn't run away, thinking that MI9 would keep protecting him, and that staying at home is safer than running away. Backerland rubbed his face. He had already received orders that after the operation regarding the manuscript had been completed, and he would hand all intelligence matters to the highest-ranking military officer at the embassy, and await the arrival of the new ambassador. Backerland was rather reluctant to part with Backland. Despite the bad weather and heavy pollution, Backland was one of the most prosperous cities in the world. Besides, the ladies here are more conservative unlike those sluts back home. Slowly seducing them into bed and removing their restraint, bit by bit, is a very satisfying and fascinating achievement. Unfortunately, I have to bid farewell to these beautiful ladies. Backerland thought gloomily, and he felt more and more resentful of the detective who dared to put up resistance. As for Rasego's own safety, Backerland wasn't worried at all. He believed that as long as Rasego wanted to, as long as he wasn't targeted by a high-sequence Bayonder, he would be able to escape immediately. This was because Rasego had special Bayonder powers. As he lost himself in thought, Backerland's eyes suddenly lit up. He saw a young lady in a crimson dress standing at the edge of the balcony with a glass of wine in her hand. She had a pretty face and a gentle temperament. Her hair was ink black and luxuriant, and her light brown eyes seemed to speak volumes. Backerland went over at once and began to chat with her. He learned that the lady was the daughter of a timber merchant named Eileen, and that her father wasn't very rich, and was trying to make his way up the ranks. With his status as Intis ambassador, Backerland quickly received Eileen's affection. After sharing two dances, their bodies became more intimate. Beautiful lady, I'd like to invite you to my room to sample some Amir wine of 1286. Eileen replied, almost without any hesitation, all right. The two of them left the ballroom and secretly went to the second floor. They entered Backerland's room, and he ordered the guards to stay away from them and not to disturb him. Before the so-called Amir wine 1286 appeared, Backerland had passionately brought Eileen to the bed. While romping around in bed, Eileen's simple skirt came undone as her pure, fair arms hugged him. While her hands gripped Backerland's shoulders, her nails and veins suddenly sprouted black, thin, fluffy spider feet. Bang! Eileen's eyes suddenly bulged as white foam poured out of her mouth. Backerland retracted the fist that he had used to hit her abdomen and stood up from the bed. He no longer had the hasty actions from before and instead wore a cold expression. Who sent you? Backerland asked in a deep voice. Eileen attempted to stand up, but the pain was too much to bear. Her eyes were filled with shock and fear. Seeing the expression on the pretty girl's face, Backerland smiled and said, It's true that I'm into beautiful ladies, but I know this problem of mine. So, every time I meet a beautiful lady, I'm especially careful. Speak, who sent you? Don't bother resisting. I'm very good at using fire. Chapter 249, The Assassination Eileen clamped her mouth shut and angrily looked at the thin, smiling face of the ambassador with a touch of terror. Backerland stretched out his right hand which was covered in a plume of orange flames that danced silently. He took two steps forward, making a gesture as if he was pressing his palm against Eileen's skin. 
This made Eileen think of the descriptions in many novels in which cruel interrogators would use red-hot iron to brand their target's body, bringing about an extremely painful experience. No, I can't be that brutal to such a beautiful lady. Dackerlin suddenly stopped his outstretched right palm and chuckled softly. He shook suddenly, turning the orange flame into a long red whip. The long whip ignited the air around it which took on the form of thorns. How? Backerland lashed his flaming whip at Eileen, burning her clothes and leaving a dark mark on her skin. Her face contorted as she screamed. Who sent you? Backerland asked again in a gentle voice. Eileen's lips quivered a few times before she finally opened them. It was. As Backerland subconsciously listened for the answer, his eyes suddenly turned bloodshot. Oh no. Backerland jerked back and rolled to the ground. In the spot where he had been standing, a flame rose up and formed a wall of fire. Splat, splat, splat. Rain like blood and flesh splattered against the wall and produced sizzling sounds. Some of them penetrated the flame, leaving a thin trail of blood on the ground. At the end of this path was the Intis ambassador, Backerland, who had stood up once again. He saw that Eileen's abdomen had been torn open and two arms wrapped in viscous liquid were sticking out from inside. With a sudden push of the two arms, a figure drilled its way out from the belly of the beautiful Eileen. It was covered in a thick, squirming blood-red liquid that continuously dripped down, and it was about the size of an adult male. It was hard to imagine that a normal woman like Eileen, with no protrusion in her abdomen, would actually have such a thing hidden inside her body. How was it stored in there? Boom. The body below Eileen's head exploded completely, turning into pure flesh and blood, surging into the form of a humanoid figure and mixing with the dripping liquid to turn into a strange red robe. The figure revealed its true appearance. It was so beautiful that it looked like a woman. The blood-red robe it wore looked like a blossoming flower under the illumination of the flames. Rose Bishop as a veteran intelligence officer, Backerland immediately identified the name of the corresponding sequence before him. Sequence 6 of the secret suppliant pathway, Rose Bishop. Every Rose Bishop was an expert when it came to flesh and blood magic. Beyonders at this sequence could hide inside the bodies of others, thereby avoiding all sorts of investigations. But the moment they emerge, the hosts would lose their lives. For the Lord, Eileen's remaining head let out a low cry and closed her eyes forever. The Rose Bishop stretched out its right hand and tapped its chest four times in the order of bottom to top, right to left. With the color of blood and the light from the flames reflecting in his eyes, he looked at Backerland and took a sudden step forward with his right foot, passing through the wall of fire. He didn't receive any damage from the fire, with only dark red liquid that continuously dripped down. Backerland retreated once again as he suddenly raised his voice. Someone, help me. Although his most capable assistant, Rosego, and several intelligence agents had been sent on a mission, there was still no lack of Bayonders in the embassy. They were military officials who had received permission from the Lone Kingdom. They were the defensive forces that were available. One sequence five, one sequence six, three sequence seven seconds, and a combination of nearly ten sequence eight seconds and nine seconds. Backerland's voice echoed around the room, but it didn't exit the premises. The music outside didn't stop and the ball continued. It was as though the room had become a completely isolated world. This, Backerland stopped his shouting, narrowed his eyes, and looked around. The Rose Bishop was in no hurry to act. He said with a chuckle, It was by your own will, the rules that were decided by yourself. You told the guards not to disturb you or come near, or let anyone close. Yes, I simply magnified your will and rules and made a slight distortion. If you want to escape this isolation, you have to defeat yourself. Backerland's expression changed slightly. What appeared to be the compliance of rules was, in fact, a distortion of them. The characteristic of using the power of authority to serve oneself made him think of another sequence's name. Baron of Corruption. Backerland growled. This was the lawyer pathway, which was sequence six of the Dark Emperor pathway. Before he could finish his sentence, Backerland's face suddenly turned extremely gloomy as he blurted out, Shepard, you're a shepherd. Who are you from the Aurora Order? Mr. A, why are you assassinating me? The Rose Bishop, no, Shepard chuckled. You don't need to know who I am. Except the Lord's blessings. His body suddenly stiffened before he could finish his sentence. It was as though his joints were covered in rust, and he seemed to have turned into a puppet. Backerland laughed rapturously. The gloominess from before disappeared in an instant. He took out a white handkerchief from his left breast pocket and wiped the corner of his mouth. I'm glad that you were able to chat with me for so long. It gave me enough time. After the white handkerchief was taken away, a thumb-sized head emerged from his left breast pocket. 
It was the head of a puppet with completely black eyes. The shepherd opened his mouth and was about to speak when he heard a hollow voice that seemed to come from afar. Hugh, after pausing, his body suddenly burgeoned, and his skin turned dark. Two curved goat horns with strange, sinister patterns sprouted from his head, as well as wings behind his back that reeked of sulfur when they flapped. The shepherd instantly moved three meters forward, having transformed into a devil-like creature. But even so, it was as if every one of his joints was firmly shackled. His movements were stiff and slow, and his thoughts were starting to blur. You still have the power of the devil. As expected of a shepherd, let me send you to your lord. Without further ado, a flaming long spear with a blazing white tip materialized in the middle of Backerlin's right palm. He bent his back, about to throw the spear to pin the shepherd to the wall and burn him to ashes. Sequence 7 Pyromaniac of the Conspiracist Pathway had the ancient name, Fire Mage. Cough, 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 cough. At that moment, Backerlin began to cough violently, coughing so hard that he felt as if he was about to spit out his heart and lungs. His flaming spear lost control from his coughing and disappeared, inch by inch. His face flushed red and his forehead was scorching hot from his coughing fit. His influence on his enemy, that he derived from a mystical item, was lifted. The shepherd was freed from his sluggishness and returned to normal. Why do you think I was having such a long chat with you? How does severe pneumonia and an unstoppable cough feel like? The devilish face asked with the corners of his mouth hooked. Upon hearing these words, Backerlin suddenly recalled the enemy's beautiful and enchanting appearance when he first appeared and regretfully said, Cough. Cough. A disease. You. Cough. Cough. Killed a. Cough. 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 A demoness of affliction. The shepherd dispelled his devil-like form as his figure turned into a series of stacked afterimages. He chuckled and said, No, I only received a gift from St. Tenebris. I know conspiracists have all sorts of means available to them, so I'll be using my strongest ability now so that you won't have any unnecessary hope. A book appeared before him, a translucent and blurry book. The ancient book flipped rapidly and with a soft chant, I came, I saw, I record. As long as I have recorded it, I'll be able to use it once. This is an ability that St. Tenebris had deliberately demonstrated to me. Although I only have half of its original effect, it's still enough. The shepherd's voice turned hollow, and his body was enveloped by the darkness that spewed out from the book. He quickly turned into a small giant, about 2.3 to 2.4 meters tall. His entire body was covered in cold, black armor. At the space where his eyes should be, there were two glowing crimson red blobs. The Dark Knight raised a broadsword in his hands, took a step forward, and delivered an unrelenting chop. No, why? As Backerlin tragically screamed, the layers of flames that gushed out of his body were split apart. All sorts of lights exploded and were split open, and his body was split into two halves. Thud, Backerlin fell to the ground. No blood came out of his massive wound. Even his soul seemed to be corroded and destroyed by the black sword that didn't seem to exist. Boom, boom, boom. The plumes of fire that spewed out of Backerlin's body lost control, causing the blast that shook the room and sent the glass rattling. And at that moment, the isolation that had been created by his own will vanished with his death. The shepherd didn't stop, nor did he wait for the Beyonder characteristic to appear. He restored his inconspicuous appearance and seized the opportunity before the military officials of the embassy arrived, sprinting through the layers of walls and into the darkness outside. At 15 Minsk Street, Klein paused with his right hand on the handle. He decided to throw a coin before he opened the door. Since Ian had already come, the revelation that he had seen in the dream had already happened. That meant that danger could come at any moment. While muttering the words the visitor outside will bring danger, Klein flicked up a quarter pence and watched it fall to his palm, its number side facing up. Negative, Klein muttered to himself as he reached for the handle. However, he didn't let his guard down. He knew that there was a mid-sequence beyonder of the same pathway as him on the ambassador's side who could interfere with his divination. If it was that person, it would be normal for him to get the wrong result. It's a pity that I don't have the time or an opportunity to investigate it above the gray fog. Klein looked through the door for a moment with his spirit vision. Realizing that nothing was amiss, he opened the door and took two steps back. Dressed in a black and white checkered uniform, Sergeant Faxine took off his hat and said with a serious expression, I've been sent by the higher-ups to tell you that you must be careful tonight and tomorrow. Be careful of strangers. 